I want to talk about the importance that I think should be attached to long-lived teams. Um, while accepting that for some people this might seem quite utopian because we live in a strained economic climate, of course. But nonetheless, I do think it's worth reflecting on how valuable it can be to work in long-lived teams. And this talk is also concerned with how it's possible in those teams to, to be working very creatively across what we call the primary secondary analysis spectrum. Um, when we're doing primary anal analysis, we're doing analysis on data that we've generated for a particular purpose we had in mind. So that's primary analysis. The terms are far more complex than this, but just to start us off in a simple way. Um, by secondary analysis, um, this term tends to refer, refer to other uses to, than those that were originally planned when the data were first being generated by um, a parent study. Um, and we've already heard um, from Natasha's um, talk today that there is currently a lot of interest in moving um, data from the primary context into a context where uses that were not, not originally planned um, are promoted through perhaps putting the data in a public um, archive. So this is a very live set of issues. Um, my talk is going to be very different from Natasha's. Um, I do just want to start off by rehearsing the case that's been made more in the longitudinal qualitative literature about why relationships um, are so important in longitudinal research. Just very, very briefly to run through some comments um, for those of you who may not be entirely familiar with this literature. Um, why are relationships important? Because when we're doing research um, with other researchers with whom we share relationships, the word shared is a bit more difficult than I'm intimating right now, but it generates a familiarity and depth of knowledge um, and a co-production of knowledge between the researchers over time. It can promote, these are the, the, the pro-arguments, the strongest pro-arguments for relationships being part of QLR. Cross-generational exchanges, exchanges across different generations of researchers and distribute the kinds of goods, the capitals, um, the resources that are so valuable in the research process. We've already heard that there are these ambitions to share in an ethical way, share and pool the valued resources that go along with um, doing research as researchers in academic and policy and other contexts. This is the data sharing and pooling, data reciprocity um, um, idea that underpins the move to um, archiving that Natasha has already been troubling for us. Um, intimacy is often seen as a resource, hence the case for long-term relationships in QLR. Rachel herself has talked about this quite a lot, that intimate research is intensive research in that it can bring insight. Intensive engagement with subject matter can bring insight, and it can promote reflexivity that's worked up on over time, not just simply at a snapshot in time when you're looking back, but over time um, that brings um, another resource um, through relationships in the research into the research process. There are arguments about intimacy being a source of provocation, which I'm not going to talk about here. But I do think it's important to recognise how often it's um, discussed, um, this turn to relationships in longitudinal research, to be a really good thing in terms of the amount of careful judgement based on practical knowledge, based in time and place, that it makes possible. That quotation is from Rod, Roz, Roz, Roz Edwards, and her colleague um, in a book on feminist ethics in, um, in qualitative research. Also, I just added on to the end of this list, we're caught up in a digital age. Technology brings so much um, of benefit to the research community, but it does risk obsolescence. Whereas relationships, it's often argued, can promote resilience um, because our relationships can endure, but also adapt over time. So there is a strong case for um, researching over time in teams, in, relation, in relationships with others. Um, I was part of, I was very privileged to be part of one of the Timescapes projects led by Bren Neal, a qualitative longitudinal network. For many, for, for five years, 
um, we were doing a study of accounts provided by two co cohorts of men, talking about their lived experiences and relationships in and through time. And as part of that, we had this very unique experience of trying to, to do something more by putting the projects together as part of a, a scaling up exercise and to promote qualitative secondary analysis through putting our data, sharing our data through a data archive. Um, in reflecting on the tension dilemmas of being part of that qualitative secondary analysis in initiative, we've, we've located our reflections in this context of a rising sense of optimism that if we share our data and we put our data into um, archives, then we can navigate profound socio-cultural, political and economic challenges. That's the case for um, uh, secondary analysis that you haven't heard thus far. What you've heard is Natasha giving the case for, for troubling and thinking and rethinking about the deeper challenges involved. Likewise, when we were reflecting as a project team on our experiences, we did think that there was too much privileging of conceptual and substantive developments as important as they are over continuing professional and ethical challenges. And this is something that you've heard very much now from my, about from Natasha, the continuing professional ethical challenges of doing this um, exercise of sharing and pooling our data in the hope that our, the impact of our research can be scaled up. In our article that's just out in Forum Qualitative Social Research, we go through the historical and institutional context. We look at these ideas about working across the primary, secondary analysis spectrum. But then we also ask about the more professionally challenging issues, the epistemological issue, issues that arise if we really start to think more critically about treating data as freestanding, can we? I think um, Natasha suggested it's more troubling than we might once have thought. And that there is a problem with this realist position of trying to make data whole. So we've been doing some very detailed um, looking at our relational and negotiated workings with data and thinking very much about how can we create the legacies as creators of original work in a way which I think is quite complementary to some of the points that Natasha is making. I don't have time to, to dwell on this because I want to just trip over some other points. But maybe we should say that there are, in terms of qualitative secondary analysis, there are some strong arg arguments that remain outstanding. But maybe it's better when the data sets are that are being reused by secondary analysts are temporally, historically and analytically separate from the originating team. We were doing something in Timescapes that was very challenging. We were trying to do secondary analysis concurrently with doing primary analysis. And I think that has meant that we haven't, in we we're sort of before our time in a way, we haven't yet come to terms with the risks there might be of detriment to the legacies of both the primary and secondary analysis projects. Can relationships be shared? Um, this is this, the, the heading for this set of first talks that Rachel suggested for today. I would suggest that there are many powerful in insights afforded by thinking relationally. And Feminist researchers have talked about the ethics of relational research very extensively. And in so doing, therefore, they have posed many challenges to relational ways of working too. So we need to sort of get deeper to understanding the, the sort of challenges that are involved when we're sharing relationships too. The ties that may be very enabling between us through deepening understanding, through increasing rate reflexivity, as I started off talking about in the first slide, there can also be ties that bind. They can be restricting. Interdependency between parties can mean that we feel constrained if it's set alongside dominant liberal humanist ideas that we should have freedom of choice. And there are so many cultural temptations to over-idealise particular ideas of relationships. For example, oversimplified ideas about it means to adopt an ethical relationship of care, as important as that is. We've put together a reading list um, as a resource for you when you leave today. If you would like to really try to think of going deeper, sometimes this is called a psychosocial level of thinking, um, which draws on research that thinks about relationships as being produced in discourses and working at a level of deep subjective awareness and sort of lack of awareness, that there are often things that we think we know and we don't quite know. This psychosocial turn um, within 
um, qualitative longitudinal research is now um, up and running. There are some people who are very um, keen on promoting it. And there are some classics in social psychology that I've put onto the reading list. If you really want to get asking the difficult and necessary questions about research relationships being shared. Those are just the two um, references that I've, I've suggested you look at. On a positive note, and I have just a couple of minutes, in um, my own working life, I've been privileged to work as part of the Men's Fathers team, which I headed up as part of Timescapes. And I'm now um, heading up uh, an energy biographies project that's part of an energy and communities network where we're trying to think about how do we make the transition into a low carbon future where we're using less energy, using energy more efficiently, um, are living our lives in ways which are less dependent on having energy immediately there for us to use. Here are just some images from one of the case sites that we've been working in, um, in Pembrokeshire, in West Wales. Some images of a low carbon future. We have put together, we've reconstituted our original team. Um, we're using um, qualitative longitudinal research interviews, drawing very much on the experiences that we had as part of the original Timescapes network, which um, Bren headed up, adapted to this new topic area um, of making low carbon transitions. How are we going to move into a situation of less intensive demand for energy? Is it possible to create new working relationships among members of an enlarged originating project, or is this going to be something terribly troubling to do? We've tried it. Um, those are just some of the methods um, on the Energy Biology Project, and to show that you are, we're doing a qualitative longitudinal project involving biographical narrative interviews, and we are asking lots of searching questions about people's imagined futures. We have um, in the course of um, generating new data, experimented by reusing a data set that part of the Energy Biographies team has brought with them from previous research. Public perceptions of different forms of energy production around two particular nuclear and coal-fired power, power generation sites and worked together as two teams that have sort of been bolted together the longitudinal qualitative team from Timescapes and the energy biographies team looking at low carbon transitions and tried out, can we reuse data working as a reconstituted larger team? We've been looking at questions around intergenerational equity based on some known problematics in the research literature which came from the energy team. But um, what happened was we used the Menace Fathers research strategy where Fiona um, Shirani initially expected some data which was part of the, the original data set from the energy um, research team to reveal a temporal pattern relating people's life course positioning to ethical extensions into the future and connections formed between their own practices and energy consumption. We have managed it. It has been something that's been very, very successful but it has been extre extremely challenging to do. This is a slide that's presenting some of the findings. There was a lot of contentiousness about whether we should really be thinking about the sorts of living links that people can make to the future in terms of the fact that they have children and that their empath empathic relationships with the future are through those living links. We've had a lot of discussion about that. But what we have done is really try, we have managed to establish that when there are competing pressures and moral demands, with something have, having to give in the present, in order to understand what this is likely to be and what's likely to give, means paying attention to the different time horizons associated with such pressures. And that research on disconnected futures um, has now been accepted for a paper in lo the local environment journal. So in a way, academically, it's been a huge success. We've learned a lot in the process. I think it does show us again that qualitative longitudinal research offers the promise of temporal insights that can be grasped when we move to new substantive arenas. Reliance in qualitative longitudinal, sort, longitudinal research on the importance of analytical work generated through relationship-focused research has remained very important. We knew as we were working together how important it was that we used established teamwork practices but also that we tried to deepen those practices and strengthen the qualitative longitudinal research 
and epistemic claims by bringing the teams together. It was possible to change established team boundaries and produce analytic work with academic value. But there is a caveat here. It's not always clear in what ways the research of relationships, even within such teams, are sharing relationships. There are, always we, there are many ways that we need to build theoretical understanding of this. And um, my own view of this is that while I think there's reason for a good deal of optimism, I think we probably do need to be developing a far more profound theoretical scaffolding to get a real grasp of what we're claiming when we're claiming that we're doing longitudinal research based on the sharing of relationships. <laughs>